So we're going to look now at the, the sections from 12, 13, and 14 in one kind of blast because they're relatively brief sections of the text and relatively straightforward. So in this chapter 12, you see the narrator again in that kind of work scenario, confronted by his boss, as he has been previously in the text, you know, when we think about him doing the work on the, the presentation, but this time with a much greater sense of assertion. And, and there's a suggestion, I think, of the, the kind of potentially positive impacts of, of Fight Club and Tyler Durden and, and Project Mayhem. So he says, how does Polanyi use the insomnia metaphor to re-emphasize the narrator's alienation at the top of 96? So <clears throat> we're looking at this passage here. We talk about the narrator's role at work. Um, I'm just going to change the focus a little there. He talks about his, his job, new leather multiplied by labor costs, multiplied by administration costs would equal more than our first quarter profits. If anyone discovers our mistake, we can still pay off a lot of grieving families before we come close to the cost of retrofitting 6,500 leather interiors. By this week, we're doing a recall campaign, and this week, the insomnia is back. Insomnia, and now the whole world figures to stop by and take a dump on my grave. So we've got, again, you know, the, the sheer inauthenticity and, and horror of the nature of the narrator's job, creating this sense of alienation and bringing back his um, insomnia, which is always the kind of metaphorical signpost that he is deeply alienated from himself and the work that he's carrying out here. The next question focuses on the fragmentary narration at the middle of the bottom from 96, which is again another kind of aesthetic um, feature of the text that's, that signposts that sense of alienation. So how does the fragmentary narration in this passage give the narrator a greater sense of assertiveness to similar incidents that occur earlier in the text? And why might Fight Club have had this impact on his personality? So we're looking in this passage from 97 here. The hole in my cheek, the blue-black swelling around my eyes, and the swollen red scar of Tyler's kiss on the back of my hand, a copy of a copy of a copy. Speculation. Why does Tyler want 10 copies of the Fight Club rules? Hindu cow. What I would do, I say, is I'd be very careful who I talk to about this paper. I say it sounds like some dangerous psychotic killer wrote this, and this button-down schizophrenic could probably go over the edge at any moment in the working day and stalk from office to office with an Armalite AR-180 carbine gas-operated semi-automatic. My boss just looks at me. The guy, I say, is probably at home every night with a little rat tail file filing across into the tip of every one of his rounds. This way, when he shows up to work one morning and pumps around into his nagging, ineffectual, petty, whining, butt-sucking, candy-ass boss, that one round will split along the file grooves and spread open the way a dum dum bullet flowers inside you to blow a bushel load of your own stinking guts out through your spine. Picture your gut chakra opening in a slow motion explosion of sausage casing small intestine. So you've got again these little fragments of narration in this passage where he talks first of all about the physical nature of his wounding, but then there's this sense of the simulation intruding on this. And again, perhaps then the logical explanation for why this violent fantasy has to occur. So he's looking and licking his wounds quite literally, but then the insomnia, inauthenticity simulation sort of intrudes here. And there are these little fragments of the remains of other moments of alienation. So these are the kind of fragments of other motion, other moments of alienation from earlier on in the text. And then questions about what Tyler is doing. So we've got, again, these are the fragments of the narration. And then this much more forceful, coherent explanation, which is Tyler, again, speaking through him, the id embodied in language, with this extremely, extraordinarily violent fantasy of destroying his boss. So we have a much greater sense of assertiveness and, and actually of Tyler controlling the, the, the narrator here in conflict with society. So it's, it's basically ramping up in intensity from the ways that it's been represented previously. <clears throat> so 
we're going to then jump into chapter 13, um, which is, is largely concerned with, with Marla. Marla asking the narrator to check her body for cancer, and the narrator hopes that this will lead to a kind of rapprochement between them after he's been selling off um, her own mother's body fat. So the question here concerns cancer as a kind of a metaphor for proliferating destruction and degradation, and as then something authentic, which Marla embraces more directly and honestly than the narrator. He, she is much more in connection with this element of, of life and, and is more authentically connected to herself than the narrator. It says, how does this passage underline the persistence of the narrator's failure to embrace this aspect of his own degradation? How might this be limiting his potential for empowerment and regeneration through destruction? So we're looking at the section towards the end of the chapter from 106. And the narrator here explains Marla has the scar from Tyler's kiss on the back of her hand. I want to make Marla laugh so I don't tell her about the last time I hugged Chloe, Chloe without hair, a skeleton dipped in yellow wax with a silk scarf tied around her bald head. I hugged Chloe one last time before she disappeared forever and I told her she looked like a pirate and she laughed. Me, when I go to the beach, I always sit with my right foot tucked under me, Australia and New Zealand, or I keep it buried in the sand. My fear is that people will see my foot and I'll start to die in their minds. The cancer I don't have is everywhere now. I don't tell Marla that. There are a lot of things we don't want to know about the people we love. To warm her up, to make her laugh, I tell Marla about the woman in Dear Abby who married a handsome, successful mortician and on their wedding night he made her soak in a tub of ice water until her skin was freezing to the touch and then he made her lie in bed completely, still while he had intercourse with her cold in her body. The funny thing is this woman had done this as a newlywed and had gone on to do it for the next 10 years of marriage and now she was writing to dear Abby to ask if Abby thought it meant something. So again, you've got this sense of Marla's, Marla in this chapter finds out that she may actually have some form of cancer and that she is actually experiencing a moment of authentic panic about mortality in the chapter and the narrator himself is unable to approach mortality with the same sense of honesty and that's why he talks here and I think this is the most important part of the passage when I go to the beach I always sit with my right foot tucked under me my fear is that people will see my foot and I'll start to die in their minds the cancer I don't have is everywhere now I don't tell Marla that here he's actually distant from the reality because he's panicking about people thinking that he's dead and dying So again, in terms of his connection with reality and his connection with mortality, he's, he's, he's extremely distant from this in a way that Marla is not. And then we have this bizarre story at the end that's supposed to make her laugh and cheer her up, that in some way people have this kind of fetish for mortality. And that's what the purpose of this story is. And then the final reflection, the funny thing is that this woman had done this as a newlywed and had gone on to do it for the next 10 years of marriage and now she was writing to dear Abby to ask if Abby thought it meant something. So there is then this sense of people kind of fetishizing mortality in the story, which is precisely what the narrator is doing, but not fully realising. He fetishizes mortality in... Marla, but is not fully cognizant of this fact. So he's he is in the same sort of position as this man in the anecdote who is kind of forcing his wife to pretend that she's dead before he sort of necrophilia, a sort of simulation of necrophilia um, that I think captures exactly the status of, of, of the narrator here. He's kind of engaging through simulations of mortality still, whilst Marla now internalizes the concept of death because of her own panic about actually having cancer. So we see a contrast building up between Marla and the narrator here. Chapter 14, the narrator thinks about the benefits of cancer and support groups. So he then reflects on the benefits of, of, of being authentically connected to mortality. And then Marla talks about her job at a funeral home. And then the narrator gets a call from a police inspector who believes that he blew up his own apartment. So again, we have this enormous sense of self-delusion in this chapter. 
Um, and a build-up of this contrast between Mahler and the narrator. So the first question is, how does Palanik underline the contrast between the ways in which Mahler and the narrator embrace degradation and mortality at the top of 109? So our focus is here. Mahler started a job doing prepaid funeral plans for a mortuary where sometimes great fat men, but usually fat women, would come out of the mortuary showroom carrying a crematoria in the size of an egg cup. And Marla would sit there at her desk in the foyer with her hair tied down and her snag pantyhose and breast lump and doom and say, Madam, don't flatter yourself. We couldn't e get even your burned up head into that tiny thing. Go back and get an urn the size of a bowling ball. Marla's, Marla's heart looked the way my face was, the crap and the trash of the world, post-consumer human butt wipe that no one would ever go to the trouble to recycle. So here, if you think about cancer as the kind of... the the sort of apotheosis, the, the highest possible form of the death degradation metaphor that, that runs throughout this story, that Mahler embraces this type of degradation on purpose and, and, and consciously by choosing to carry out a job like this. And that's precisely the opposite of the, of the narrator, narrator's own self-delusion. You know, so if you think about his own understanding of his own mortality, it, it's feeble because it's relying upon uh, a projection uh, that, that embodies the part of the psyche that would be authentically connected to mortality if he'd actually integrated it into himself. So while, while Tyler exists, he is impossibly distant from his own mortality and his own sense of authenticity, whereas Marla here is very deliberately uh, kind of posited as a contrasting character who represents a, a, an honest connection with mortality and, and the type of degradation that Tyler supposedly espouses and believes it, especially in that line there, which is called post-consumer human butt wipe that no one would ever go to the trouble to recycle. So we've got there, again, that very direct contrast established between Mara and the narrator. Our last question, 10, says, how does the fragmentary narration in the conclusion of the chapter underline the self-deception in the narrator's attitude towards mortality and his own identity? So we've got this, again, his own sense of delusion being foregrounded by this stylistic choice of, of fragmentary narration on Polanyi's part. So it starts with this, disaster is a natural part of my evolution, Tyler whispered, towards tragedy and dissolution. I told the detective that it was the refrigerator that blew up my condo. I'm breaking my attachment to physical power and possessions, Tyler whispered, because only through destroying myself can I rediscover the greater power of my spirit. The dynamite, the detective said, there were impurities, a residue of ammonium oxalate and potassium perchloride that might mean the bomb was homemade and the deadbolt on the front door was shattered. I said I was in Washington, D.C. that night. The detective on the phone explained how someone had sprayed a canister of Freon into the deadbolt lock and then tapped the lock with a cold chisel to shatter the cylinder. This is the way the criminals are stealing bicycles. The liberator who destroys my property, Tyler said, is fighting to save my spirit. The teacher who clears all possessions from my path will set me free. The detective said whoever set the homemade dynamite could have turned on the gas and blown out the pilot lights on the stove days before the explosion took place. The gas was just the trigger. It would take days for the gas to fill the condo before it reached the compressor at the base of the refrigerator and the compressor's electric motor set off the explosion. Tell him, Tyler whispered. Yes, you did it. You blew it all up. That's what he wants to hear. I tell the detective, no, I did not leave the gas on and then leave town. I loved my life. I loved that condo. I loved every stick of furniture. That was my whole life. Everything, the lamps, the chairs, the rugs were me. The dishes in the cabinets were me. The plants were me. The television was me. It was me that blew up. Couldn't he see that? The detective said not to leave town. So here is, I think, the first expression of that internal conflict in a kind of literal, a, a sort of literalized externalization. The explosion of the apartment is the externalization of the narrator's internal conflict. And we see that through these little fragmentary stylistic decisions that Polanyi makes here, where we, we have the discussion from the detective about the nature of the crime scene and then this sort of whispering from Tyler, this sort of uh, mantra like whispering from Tyler about the need for degradation and destruction. So you have lots of these little fragments of Tyler as he goes through this um, 
crime scene with the detective speaking to him about the, the internal motives for this destruction. And so what we then see in this fragmentary narration is a stylistic expression of the narrator's internal conflict, which is itself externalized in the narrative event that's being described, the explosion of the apartment, which represents the kind of destruction of his inauthentic self. So that fragmentary narration is one of those aesthetic kind of stylistic decisions that Polanyi makes to embody the internal conflict of the narrator and his fragmentation on the level of literary style, which is itself expressed in the level of the plot through the destruction of the narrator's apartment, which represents his internal conflict and his alienated, inauthentic self.